So I'm, 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 I'm Stephen Johnston, Museum of the History of Science, and uh, I'm, I'm here today just to say a few things about our current special exhibition, Geek is Good. You, you may have seen it, um, big poster in, in, in Broad Street. Um, if you haven't seen it so far, you still have a chance that you, know, you can't really duck it just by, just by being here. I want to pick out three um, aspects, three novel elements in staging this exhibition. I want to just say something about how the exhibition came together. I want to say how we engaged with new audiences and made, made new partners for this exhibition. And I'll say something too about how we created the accompanying public programme. One other thing that was new about it was the title. We don't normally say things like, you know, something is good. In, 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 in university museums. And part of the point of that was that we were just playing on the fact that geek used to be a pejorative term. You would dismiss someone as a geek. And since the days of Mark Zuckerberg being a, you know, a billionaire, it's kind of good to be a geek now. It, it's become a very positive term. And we wanted to play on that in the exhibition. So I'm not going to be talking much about the exhibition, but if you haven't seen it, I better just say a couple of words about it, just otherwise it'll be a little opaque, what is going on here. It's an exhibition that mostly draws on the collections of the Museum of the History of Science. But we wanted to present the objects there, not as beautiful brass and glass, very easy to see our, our, our permanent displays that way. We wanted to get over the idea that um, these were objects of enthusiasm. These were the geek gadgets of their day, whenever that day was. And to try and turn things on their head like that, um, the exhibition is history in reverse. It doesn't start from the past and come up to now. It starts in the present and goes backwards. Um, it starts with, will that work? Um, it starts with things like that little green board there, which is a complete computer, a modern day bit of coding device, a Raspberry Pi. We've got things like a BBC Micro from the early 80s where, where mothers and fathers fondly recollect with their sons and daughters the happy days of good programming. So it starts up with contemporary things and it goes backwards into the past. It, it ends up um, with the claim that Chaucer was a geek. What's happened there? He does say that, yes, because he was the first English technical author, writing in English on, we had to find a way to fit an astrolabe or two into our exhibitions. We always managed to shoehorn one in somehow. So that gives you a tiny flavor of what that exhibition has in it. What about the launch of it? Well, it was done differently. Um, the launch happened uh, in, a, in a different format, a different forum, a different venue for us. Um, it was number 34 of the sequence of Oxford Geek Nights. It's a regular meetup of um, IT people, digital web designers, people networking, um, and it happens upstairs in a pub in Jericho. So we'd, we'd never launched in such a venue before. And it was unusual as well, because these meetings have talks, um, sort of keynote talks, all down to having 60 second slots to introduce something. So my colleague and co-curator, Scott Billings, I don't think he can be here today, um, I've got eight minutes. Scott had 60 seconds to present this exhibition and try to call for help, because we wanted help. It was something we couldn't do just by ourselves. And this Got Oxford Geek Night was a great way to do that, a very different audience, new sorts of people, but also asking for help on, on social media, using the museum's Twitter account to get help in sourcing things like that BBC Micro. That's not ours, we don't have that. We just put a call out and we got genuine members of the public to volunteer their working 80s computers that could be put on display in the museum, not as static display, but as interactive things. We've got people coming in and coding and doing stuff like writing the word geek. That's very hard to do when you're manipulating an old fashioned screen from the 80s. So that let us do a, a kind of um, homebrew corner in the exhibition where you can come along and actually get a feel for computing as it was 30 years ago. And only done because we were able to engage with that sort of, that sort of public, just keen people out there who brand themselves as geeks are keen to show others um, what is possible, what they have done. And 
It's not to say that it would have been impossible to do that before the days of Twitter, but it makes it an awful lot quicker. You can get to people much more quickly. Um, it fans out. It's, it's just a lot more effective, I think, um, as a rapid way to develop uh, the idea of an exhibition and, and to make it seem real. So that's something about how we launched it and the kind of ways that we were able to create new partnerships. It also, the exhibition also gets us to engage differently with visitors, to have them engage differently with us. It has in it a little Raspberry Pi computer, which is a camera attached. You can go in there and you can get your picture taken. It's actually quite a fancy camera, as good as the ones in your smartphone, but everyone gets to appear in a highly pixelated little geek gallery um, which you can see um, not just members of staff, but genuine public put themselves up for this and they go up uh, online on the exhibition's website. Perhaps more striking um, for its public involvement is something that comes right at the very end of the exhibition. It uh, looks a bit like a photo booth that, that was created by our ever incredibly resourceful technician, Owen Shaw. Um, but it's not a photo booth, it's a video booth. This is the geek confession booth. And by the time you've gone through the exhibition, you're sufficiently inflamed um, that you come in here and you sit down and you have 30 seconds to record your geekiest confession. What's the, the geekiest thing you've ever done? Um, or at least what are you willing to admit to in, in public? Um, when I've done tours of the exhibition, I've tended to say, well, obviously it's just between you and us unless it's really good, <laughs> in which case we'll put it up online. So I don't have time to, to show you clips from that now, but you can go to the exhibition website and you can see some of the contributions and they really are great. Obviously there's lots of rubbish and you kind of expect that, but there's some really um, sort of insightful and uh, revealing comments from, from visitors uh, coming to the exhibition. So trying to engage differently with our visitors, what about public programming? I've only got a minute left, well. Um, we had a different way of, 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 of engaging. Um, we had a hosting at the museum of one of these Oxford Geek Nights. We got different people coming in there, uh, a new audience that hadn't been to the museum before. We've never had sponsored free beer uh, as part of, our, part of our public engagement and outreach. Um, it, it managed to happen here. So, that was very effective, very successful, and it brings in people who we haven't met before. So there is a chap there, Matthew Westcott, who is coming back to us just after the exhibition ends. Um, and he's going to be part of an event, Geek Out, where he will be rising to a 32-year-old computing challenge, which is to um, write and orchestrate for a set of spectrum computers from the 80s, um, Mahler's first symphony. There's a cultural highlight that I hope will ennoble your time. Do come along to the museum, do see the exhibition, and do geek out. Thank you.